a kind, you know, beneath those eccentricities and that wild hair and those crazy twitchy things that he would do. And all that energy was a really sensitive, very intelligent, kind, humorous, and a pretty shrewd guy. Um, as the years went by and I got into the business, uh, the legitimate business, um, he and I would have a lot of dinners together. And he would say, hey, you want to have dinner with John Saxon? I said, oh, yeah, oh, sure, yeah. How about having dinner with Gary Lockwood? You know, oh, of course. And I remember Gary Lockwood complaining about Stanley Kubik. They had a shot out of 2001 where Gary's in one of those cryo chambers and he's asleep and his eyes open. And Kubik said, I don't want any expression, nothing. I just want you to open your eyes. I just want you to open your eyes. Opens his eyes, cut. That's, that's fine, Gary, but do it again. Opens his eye, cut, let's try it again. Third time, cut, and Lockwood says, what's the matter, are my eyelids overacting? <laughs> and you know, you hear stories like this all the time. And uh, Dave Friedman dinners, and you know, Harry Novak, and Sid Hay, who's just a few, few seats away from me. And then Sid and I were in the Philippines at the same time when he was making those Roger Corman movies. My dad was in the, the military, and uh, I was around a lot of those pictures that were being made back then. And uh, it's hard for me to talk about Eric. We did this thing with Blade Runner for so many years, but it actually started a long time before that, when I was on Return of the Living Dead. And um, I was kind of like the, uh, the poor man's uh, publicist at a lot of the motion picture studios for many years, like Universal and Orion, places like that. And they would, I was a genre guy. So before it became a, uh, a thing to go out and market yourself and you know, go to all the conventions and, and hit up all of the websites and do all that kind of stuff and basically publicize all these films, I'd be doing things like The Friend of the Living Dead and Robocop and Blue Velvet and I worked on all those pictures. And I would go to Eric's store first and I remember we had a great cast and crew signing for Return of the Living Dead. Uh, Dan O'Bannon was there, Bill Stout was there, Lenita Quigley was there. Had a great time doing that, and we did RoboCop together, all kinds of stuff. It was for Starship Troopers when I was working on that. And um, the funny thing was that around the time of RoboCop, I think it was, Eric started to say, hey, you know, like, we're both into wrestling. And I said, yeah. And he says, well, why don't we do this? He says, I'm going to go to your biggest presentation, you know, whenever you have a few thousand people in the room up there. About halfway through, I'll stand up and I'll say, what makes you the expert? You're so full of shit. How can you talk to these people? You don't even work in these movies. You're just like you're just like the schlockmeister. And he would go off, right? And people would sit around, and it would come out of nowhere. And I, I would always kind of play the good cop and go, well, uh, uh, gee, sir, you know, I, everyone's you know uh, entitled to their opinion. That's just fine. And people would start to boo him, and he'd say, well, well, I'll be waiting for you after the show, and he'd stop out. <laughs> We did this, I swear, for over 20 years, and no one ever caught on. And the scary thing was, he'd always come back after it, he'd be thrilled, he'd go, oh, we did another like wrestling, you know, wrestling thing. And I'd say, but Eric, you, know, you gotta watch out. And he'd go, why? And he says, well, well, people have come up to me and said, they want to hurt you. <laughs> and where can they find you? And I said, I don't know, he was some guy. But if there's one thing that Eric wasn't, was some guy. Um, I saw him about two weeks before they closed the store, or I don't know, uh, John or Scott might be able to tell me this better, but he was moving boxes out, and I helped him move some boxes out. He was talking, as someone else said, about opening a store in Burbank, or maybe going online, and he was still the same old there. He, he, he'd slow down a little bit. Um, I don't know if you know, but he had had an episode about three years ago at the Comic-Con, and he had had to go to a hospital in Hillcrest, and uh, that happened right in the middle of the weekend. And I went and I visited him in his room, and he seemed fine, and they, they didn't catch the cardiac problem. They just said, well, maybe it's exhaustion, or maybe it's all those burritos you've been eating all day. But uh, I, knew he, I knew he wasn't well, but I thanked him that day, because I'd known him for such a long time. And he was already talking, I'm writing another book, and he said, you know, when you do this book, let's do something, promo it like we did with the Blade Runner book and the Conan book. I said, sure. And about two weeks later, there's a thing about William Castle called Spine Tingler that Jeffrey Schwartz directed. And I'm one of the talking heads in that. Except that I had a mustache back then, and it's a little Hitler-like mustache, right? 
And Eric calls me at 1 o'clock in the morning, and I'm asleep. And he goes, Paul, Paul, you're on Turner. I go, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, right. You mean the, the spine tingler thing? He goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. He says, you're on about William Castle. I said, that's great. He says, you know what they've done? I go, what? He says, they just cut from you to Hitler. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the last time I spoke with him. So I'd like to think that somewhere up in that celestial square circle, you know, that he loves so much of, Eric is wrestling Santo right now. <laughs> and my money's on Eric. Thank you. I'd like to bring up a person next who's known Eric longer than any of us, his brother, Bobby Caden. <laughs> Seriously, I, I left home when I was 15 and uh, hitchhiked around the United States. I had a little dog and I, I was the one that took off. I was restless. Uh, I hitchhiked around the country for maybe nine months a year. I can't remember. And uh, came back home. Maybe I was 13. I can't remember. Uh, my brother... Uh, I don't mean this in a funny way, but he, he, he's the one that got me introduced to LSD and drugs. <laughs> I don't mean it. It actually helped me to get through it young. Because I, took, I was wild when I was 13. I think I was wild with an error, to be honest with you. But he did introduce me to the drugs. <laughs> But I think I turned out okay. <laughs> uh, I've lived in Texas for the last 40, 45 years. I've been driving a semi truck. Um, I drove 4,000 miles a week, probably 27 years, going from California uh, to New York and back, or East Coast, hauling strawberries, just back and forth, back and forth. And that was my life. And uh, in 2000, I became a security guard. For about 10 years, till 2010, they cut my hours. I went back to trucking now, which I really didn't want to do, because I enjoyed being home every night. But uh, the few things I remember, like I said, y'all giving me the inside of my brother, I did not know. I mean, his life, and I really appreciate it, because we didn't, keeping much contact after uh, I left home. I'd see him, I'm trying to think, the period when I was 16 to probably, the, probably 2000, we didn't communicate. I was doing my thing and Eric was doing his thing. And I had no clue that he had all these people, all the people that loved him. I didn't know about this, because he never told me. Well, of course, I didn't keep in contact with him, but I had no clue. That this, uh, that he had a life like this, and, and I'm, I'm just flabbergasted. I mean, it's just amazing to me. Uh, I'm really happy that he has so many friends. You know, it really makes me feel good. And uh, is there a Jim West? Any of his old friends I knew out here? Jim Peters, Jim West. Because these are the guys I knew. My brother's friends. When my brother was 16, I guess I was 14 when I came back from hitchhiking or even uh, around then, I heard y'all talk about clubhouses. Well, we had a clubhouse. Eric had a clubhouse, a pool table, and a little room in the back that we had built. I was 14, he was probably 16. All his buddies, I'd hang out with his friends. And we'd all be in this room maybe doing something we shouldn't be, a little illegal. <laughs> and that's, he played pool, partying all night, uh, but he'd always bring his friends, he'd go out, if we needed something, he'd go out and get, it. we're hungry, needed, you know, maybe after smoking something, you know. <laughs> and the only one I guess, we'll get some food out, bring it, you know, don't worry about it, everything's good. We'd just munch down, and, uh, 
one thing I remember, and this isn't, uh, I think this is what made the business sense of my brother. Uh, when, when we played pool, I, rem I remember this incident one night, we were playing pool and the, he was chalking his pool stick. And he looked, he looked at, the, at the chalk and he was thinking, you know, maybe I can put this in a capsule and make like mescaline, because he didn't know. I said, no, Ed, no, you cannot do that. He goes, well, it could make some money, you know, the business like that. I said, no, you'll hurt, you could kill somebody, or someone's going to be in the hospital. And I think I talked him out of that part, but uh, that's one is, it's hard for me to remember a lot. I was in pretty bad shape myself, but um, I, I just really want to say that yeah, uh, you'll be in our hearts forever. There's, you know, it's the happy times. Just always think of all the happy times you had with them. Then there, I'm sure there's hundreds of times, thousands. So just keep them in your heart. I know you will. And I'd say I, I, I really so glad that y'all came here and I got to learn all this. And did you want to say a quick thing about Uncle Eric? Uncle Eric? This is my granddaughter, Rihanna, and she wants to say something. Hello, five or six years I was seeing him once a year in Las Vegas and we'd go out to the rodeo and uh, i take my family to the rodeo in Vegas and then we meet there because he did I guess a lot of conventions there right so we meet there and uh, I talked to my brother two days before he passed uh, was our last conversation I hadn't talked to him in a long time and I'm glad I got to talk to him um, before this happened, and uh, and you, you all are right on the money about my brother. The hat, he always the little cap, and the baggy pants, and the glasses, the round, I think, short, and glasses, and it, it, it's and that's his signature. You're absolutely right. And we will keep him in our hearts forever. And thank you so much for coming here. Okay. to the star of the double feature tonight, but the hell with it. We still have some people who want to talk, and it's a lot more important to do this than to go on to Tinderera. So we'll finish up with people here, and then we'll get to the, for those who want to stay for the double feature we're doing, we'll get there eventually. Uh, and I want you to mention, too, I'm sure all of us have heard them, but Eric had the best acid stories. Um, and, I mean, he stopped doing that many, many years ago, but he would tell stories about dealing dealing to uh, various celebrity children, children of celebrities out here in L.A. And his stories always usually would think crazy things that happened, maybe at his expense, but there's uh, some really great stories, and maybe you guys will share some of them in the lobby afterwards. Let me bring up, uh, maybe I'll bring both of you guys together, um, Dukey and Carl Slayer. Right, Dukey, bring, bring uh, Dukey Flyswater down. Another friend of mine. Yeah. 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 Thanks, Alfred. I'll try and keep it together. So good to see everyone out here. I was like really shocked when I heard the church passing. Um, I owe a lot to him. Uh, I met Eric at my very first uh, horror and sci-fi convention. And place on Wilshire Boulevard. He introduced me to a lot of people. I forgot so much over the years, so much has happened. Uh, but I do remember some things. I, I do remember, though, that he was the only person that was rifling through his stuff. And I had no idea if people sold like posters and stuff like that. But I, I was completely new to the scene. I was a big sci fi horror fan, but I had no idea that people gathered together to do those things. And, uh, and so I was like particularly uh, impressed with his collection that he was dealing out there. And uh, uh, 
and then I asked him if he had anything on, on uh, Cape Canaveral monsters, which he did. And uh, we just went on and on on how much we loved this movie, Cape Canaveral monsters, and everybody just like hated it. It was done. It was done by the. It was the last movie directed by the same guy who did Robot Monster. I liked a lot more than Robot Monsters, but that was before he was wearing a baseball cap. He had this like incredible comb over that would put uh, Irwin Allen to shame. And, uh, I would hear stories like he. Now, I never saw him do drugs, but uh, I heard these great stories about how like he would be doing acid at Brian Wilson's house with the at Manson gang, and his dad had to kidnap him and. You know, taken to a convalescent hospital for a while, and I don't know if that's true, but I hope it is. Uh, because he was the stuff and will be of legends. Uh, total sweetheart, he introduced me to a lot of people that affected me in my life, like Jimmy Masson. I would have never have written Blood Diner if it wasn't for Eric. And uh, in Honor and Garage, when we did that band, uh, he was one of the, him and Scott Tish were one of the very first people we chainsawed open on stage. And um, I got to meet like Harry Novak and ended up working a year with Harry Novak because of him. And uh, uh, just so much. Uh, I remember there used to be this, this uh, club on Friday nights, uh, Club Lingerie. These guys I know, Henry and Joseph, would take over the club and call it the Veil, and they would have theme nights, uh, and they would have uh, retro nights, Nazi nights. I mean, you, you name it. And, and we did a sleaze night. Me and, and uh, Jimmy put a, a, a band together really quickly. Uh, I think it was okay, but uh, uh, we did do this song. We did the song original. Uh, called Big Bad Vic, and um, it was just after the, the horrible accident on the Twilight Zone movie. And uh, um, so yeah, it was about Vic Morrow getting killed by helicopter. Um, and uh, we put Eric, dressed him up in, in uh, <laughs> he dressed him up in like, what, what? The, Army fatigues and combat. Yeah, yeah. We dressed him up in combat gear with a, like a, a a helmet on his head, and he had like a propeller motor. <laughs> back on his head, a big slash across his neck. He was so fucking. He was. <laughs> He was so goddamn happy. <laughs> and he went to a, he went to, <laughs> he went to a convention like the next day and he won like most tasteless costume. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> so many good times to do. I miss him so, so much. He was so funny. He had no filters. He had no sense of consequence, you know? <laughs> and he just rolled with the fucking punches. Uh, I still have uh, posters hanging on my wall from this Donald room back in the, the, the days. Uh, I, I remember once he asked me to do that Jack, Jack Baker uh, benefit. And then he was like, uh, we did, and it was kind of crazy. And, and uh, we had a guy in our band that like used cross dress. And the mentors were on the, the bill. And the mentors were totally against anything that seemed to be like, you know, gay or cross dressing or anything like that. And so there would be singer L2 J drums on, on the stage. And, and he goes, like, well, we broke his guitar string. So we're waiting for the. Uh, Gabby, our, our transvestite, our cross-dressing guitar player to like change string, and 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 uh, LTG just like starts yelling things about gay people and stuff like that. He jumps on the stage and he goes, "You got no talent. I'm gonna show you some real talent. I'm gonna like uh, jack off and shit at the same time." So <laughs> off goes the trousers, <laughs> and I just like went back and. Drop cat kicked it right in the butthole when I was doing that. Uh, uh, yeah. 20 shoes. 
And Eric just came up afterwards, oh, I hear you kicked that. It'll get you in the butt. That's the funniest thing I've ever heard. You know? so, we didn't make anybody in night. Everybody invited like 10 guests. And we were, there's like more over capacity now. And no, no room for people to pay to get in. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh God, I'm going to miss him so much. And there's so many adventures we went through and, and so many different things. And, uh, it's, it, uh, it was a life well lived, and I'm glad to get a part of it. I have, um, I have a friend of Eric's, uh, Sharon Kelly Jenkins, and her daughter, uh, Rachel. Please salute. Woo! Sharon and Rachel. because Eric was Hollywood to me. There are so many people that I have met because what I would do is I wanted to come down and I met my husband a year after I met Eric and I started dating him and uh, that's the reason I'm still up in Fresno. <laughs> We've been married 29 years. But I would, yeah, I know, really. I know we don't live in Hollywood if we're married that long. <laughs> so, but I would come down on the weekends and uh, get a place where now they have Academy Awards, but it used to be the Holiday Inn. And Chris says, I can't stay there. You're going to stay with me down here. So I would stay with Chris, and Eric would go, you'll work in the store on the weekends. Pay for it to come down. <laughs> so I'd drive down every weekend, work at the store or work at a convention. And Chris thought it was the funniest thing in John because people would go, where does she go during the week? And they said, now we're just, don't say anything. We want everybody to think you live here. So the longest time, there's always people that go, well, the girl lives in LA, but she only shows up on the weekends. She doesn't come out during the week. And it was just the memories and the people that we got to sit and see. I remember when Return of the Living Dead came out and Eric was having, this was 85, so we didn't get married at 86, he was having uh, a big convention. He's always running the projection with all the movies. And Linnea was doing one of her first appearances and she was overwhelmed. You know, there was all this stuff. And my husband, he recruited him because he knew TV and film. He said, you, you, you get to run the booth for me, right? Bob says, I have to sit up there and watch all those Eric movies. You know the movies I'm talking about over and over again. And he says, okay, but I just want to meet Linnea. That's the one I want to meet. And it just got busy, you know how the things go, and the lines were backed up with every teenage boy. Bob finally got a break. Eric goes, all right, everybody stop, 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 stop. My film guy's coming down. Gets Bob down, box line, gets up, says, Linnea, right here. You gotta, this is my guy running the film. Stopped everything down, took pictures, let her meet, you know, have him meet Linnea, all this stuff. I mean, he just, it was, it was just things he did. He always thought about that. Oh, I gotta, I gotta just make sure I do this for Bob. Oh, I gotta make sure to do this for Sharon. When she was born, I get this box with a pink Minnie Mouse. I'm not sure if it was Eric or maybe John's love for Disney that got that one. But she still has it, you know. And um, I'd bring Eric, uh, I would come into the store and Eric would see her and he would just, every time we'd go, oh, 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 they would just all look at her, you know. I have a picture, she's about a year and a half old. And Eric's wearing one of his wrestling masks, and he has a cane or something. You're and doing this. yeah, he's doing a party mat, and he's got the wrestling mat. John's over here doing his famous pose, and Jamie's in the picture there, you know. And my and, dad and, looks terrified. And he's like standing here like this, holding Rachel, and she's like looking over at them. I mean, we just have pictures upon pictures upon pictures, and he has been so much a part of my life. And there are so many people that I have met working for him. Uh, when he would say, come to the convention or do this, everywhere I went, hey, you coming down? You come, come down from Fresno, right? You're going to help me in a booth, right? You know, so I would, okay, yeah, we're coming down. And uh, last time I saw Eric, because we, had, you know, as the kids get older and people do things, we didn't get down as often as we wanted to. Um, over the years of doing conventions, I had met uh, Kyra Schoen. I don't know if any of you know her, but that's Karen Cooper from Night of the Living Dead. Yeah, and she and I have become really good friends. She calls me her uh, baby West Coast sister. And um, so anytime she comes out here, the rule is I have to go see her if it's in the state of California. And she came up to San Jose in March, and she says, you have to come. I said, I'll be there. So I took off work, went up there, spent a couple of days with her. And I said, Eric has to be here. I think I text John or something. Isn't Eric supposed to be around here? He was on the total opposite side of this huge building, but I had to go find him, and I saw him. 
and he saw me coming and he was like, whoa, oh, and I love Sid, you had the hand movements down so great on Eric, you know, it's just perfect. And he's like, what, 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 what are you doing here? What are you doing here? I go, well, Kyra's here, so I'm here with Kyra, you know how that goes. And so we talked for a few minutes, and I said, okay. And I said, no, I've got to get a, I got to get a picture with you. So I took out my camera and I put my arms around him, and we leaned forward, and he was directing the pictures, and I snapped the pictures, and um, then I posted one. I go, look, John, look who I, look who I found, you know, and that was the last time I saw him. But um, I have that picture. And that was about, what, almost two and a half months ago. And I just thank God that Kyra had that convention and that we had a promise to go up there so that I could, I could give him a hug one more time. And I am, I cannot go to Hollywood Boulevard the same way again. It's just, I can't. I've been there since the beginning of the store on Las Palmas all the way up. And these people are such a part of our family now, all of them. And. I just can't believe Uncle Eric's not here anymore. We, we just love him so much. Brother was great. So you know how I grew up now. Which was awesome. I got raised by basically all of you. You knew him and we're all weird, right? So I love it. Um, this weirdo, he's so awesome. He gave me my first 21st experience in Vegas. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Uncle Eric. <laughs> no, just me and him. If it were for you guys throughout the conventions, I would not be in LA. I would not be doing makeup, special effects makeup. Go, Uncle Eric, grabbing that food. First mentor got to be Greg Nicotero because of him. <laughs> Who could ask for a greater mentor? I got argued over by Tom Savini and Greg Nicotero at Uncle Eric's booth, saying, ah, she's gonna go to my school. No, but she's gonna be my employee. This is awesome. It's awesome. So I was like, okay, I gotta get my shit together. I'm like 14, right? <laughs> um, flash forward, I finally I start moving out here, and my 21st birthday happens, and I'm like, you know, living out of my car. I'm like, I'm gonna be adventurous. You know, who needs to eat? <laughs> Uncle Eric scoops me up and he goes, hey, I got this convention. I just need someone to watch my food. <laughs> that famous line. Mm -hmm. Sold. I'm like, awesome. I haven't done this. We stop off at just about every casino the night before. And this is awesome because if you go to the casinos, I didn't know this, you get to drink for free. <laughs> so he's doing slots. I'm just sitting feeling awesome next to him, just checking out all the people. The next morning comes around, and like you guys said, he wakes up at the friggin' crack of dawn. So, <laughs> I'm hungover, and um, he trails me off. Okay, first of all, rewind. Turns out, he goes to there all the time, and he has, gets all these rewards. He got me the suite at, I think it was, like, the win or something like that. He gave me the suite. He was like, you gotta do it right, it's your 21st, and I was like, I don't know, are you sure? <laughs> I won't say, no. do you want to sleep in the other room? Because there were multiple rooms, that's how cool it was. Um, so the next morning, he comes, picks me up. I'm barely getting my life together in the morning. I just grab my makeup bag. I'm like, can't go to this convention looking like this. So I, I run off into the bathroom as soon as we get there. I do my little setup in the makeup bar, so I gotta have it. I'm like, OCD with my brush, and everything's clean. I got my makeup set up. All these actresses thought that I was in there to do makeup for them. <laughs> that was such a convenient moment. <laughs> I ended up getting to do makeup because of Eric and just this whole venture on Sandra Giles, on Cindy Pickett, on Joan Crawford, on so many people. It's and then he's just like, okay, I'm gonna go to lunch now. Um, just need you here for 10 minutes and then you can keep going and doing what you're doing. I'm like, my resume, it looks insane because of him. Going to the shop, they, they had this little picture that I gave to them and Eric and John were like, you gotta sign it, you gotta sign it. And they had it up in the store forever. Like forever. 12 years yeah, old. they just kept going, that's, that's our princess. Oh. That's what they always call me. They're with all the other celebrities. Everybody thought you were an actor. I know. Oh, great. Say, Who's that? Oh, that's Rachel. 
I got to be cool. <laughs> but without all these weirdos in my life, I, thank you. I would not be who I am today. And you don't, you don't understand the impact until you take it for granted until it's gone and then you hear all these memories and you're just so blessed that you got to be a part of it. And I'm really grateful I get to be a part of your family. Is that Tom Rinaldi still here? Tom? Yeah. Speaking of makeup, let's get a Tom Rinaldi. Tom Diggers! Tom Diggers! I remember the titty bar Tom Diggers when we all went to Disneyland. <laughs> <laughs> My brother and I stuck over the roof and Eric was amazed we actually broke into Disneyland. Man, I don't even know what to say other than I, I got out here from Texas like Bobby you know, immediately to observe this amazing immortal event because out of anyone that I met here, this was a guy that counted. You know, I mean, this guy single-handedly made introductions and made my career. I directed the Ramones video because of Eric. I met people like Van Pryor and helped her move because of Eric. I remember when I first went down to the store, he goes, why don't you go through these uh, posters, see if you find anything interesting. The third thing I opened was an original insert to Metropolis. <laughs> Probably the single most, most incredible thing I've ever done. And you know, it was sad. I, I, we were meeting in Vegas this month, at June 5th, you know, and I just bought a 42 Buick rat rod and we were going to come back to Hollywood in it. And uh, the news of this is just, is just devastating. You know, we, uh, as Matt had said, at the Dallas Frightmare, but, you know, and he was, uh, Eric was going to be out there, but unfortunately, due to Ed Neal, Eric didn't make it. I'm really pissed off at that guy for that. In fact, uh, really pissed off. It's kind of a long story, but I'll let it rest. But anyways, the guy was amazing, and what uh, <clears throat> Johnny Legend and he did, I mean, it was like a, it, it, it was, it, it should, there should have been tape rolling at all these incredible events. I mean, really astonishing shit was going down. And John and all of these characters were just equally all amazing. Jamie, you know, was incredible. Uh, you remember coming through Texas on the Chemical People Tour? Guns in your house was awesome. Oh, fuck, you remember when I was shooting those magnums on I-30? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But I mean, it was always wild as hell and went over the top. And some of those stories I haven't heard exactly. One of them, we're at the Beverly Garland, and uh, it was kind of weird. Uh, Lawrence Tierney was, in the end, even more crazed. And it was kind of like <laughs> shame. The last time I saw Lawrence Tierney, he was firing a 38 in the back of my uh, 59 Cadillac going down Hollywood Boulevard. And I think the guy was pretty shocked that I wasn't shocked, but I, you know, I was really kind of pissed off, you know? And so when I saw him at the Beverly Garland, I didn't want to be around the cocksucker because, you know, maybe he's a good guy and all of that, but, you know, but I, I got stuck with him. And so I wound up right in front of Johnny Legend's booth, I mean, Eric Hayden's booth, and then Ben Chapman was sitting there. You heard this story? And, and, and Lawrence Tierney goes up to Ben Chapman. Now, this is the first show where Ben Chapman, the creature, actually brought his wife from Hawaii. And Lawrence Tierney walks up and he goes, Hey Ben, goddamn, how you doing? You remember when we were in the service? You know, we, we, we got off in Hawaii and we went out and got picked up those whores. You know, do you, 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 you ever get that shit around your nuts or the burnt purple vesicles? It took me two weeks to get rid of that shit. And, and meanwhile, Pit Chapman's wife is just faltering and his air and are just rolling on the floor laughing, you know? It was absolutely unbelievable. I think mean, I should, uh, I don't even know where to begin. I mean, the guy, uh, out of everyone, I mean, all the people I met actually went out and helped me nurture a career that, I mean, uh, all the people he introduced me to, I mean, uh, <clears throat> Dookie Flyswater, I mean, I put him in, I got him in uh, Lord of Illusions because of Eric introducing me, and I saw Haunted Garage afterwards. 
and a myriad of relations like that, you know? But, um, shit, I don't know what more I can say. I know it's getting late, but uh, what a loss. I mean, out of a lot of people, what a loss. I mean, it, this town, I know I'll never return because in many ways it's gone now for me. Um, but anyways, thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming up. Dan Madigan, also a friend of ours. I'm there. Thank you. businessman I've ever met. Um, absolute worst. Um, many times I would see him at convention, I'd sit down and talk to him, and he'd say, oh, I just saw this wrestler, and, and he came down, I've got a tape of his career, and all his highlights, and I gave him the tape. Okay, and then I saw this guy, and he, he oh, so this wrestler came down, and he had all his, all his highlights, and I gave him the DVD. I said, okay. I said, Eric, you know, the idea is to make a profit here, and he, then we had that conversation, remember? And yeah, we had this conversation, he was giving things, Eric gave, 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 he just gave. And this is a town with people to take. And he was an anomaly in this town. When I told him I was doing a, a Mexican wrestling book, he couldn't have been happier. This, he really couldn't, I said, Eric, I'm doing a book called Mondo Lucha Gogo, -Go, so Mexican wrestling. He jumped up, he gave me lobby cards, posters, booklets, everything opened up. And we, it was just amazing. And when I sit and talk to Eric, about wrestling, I worked in rock and roll, I worked in wrestling, I worked in Harlem, we everything Eric loved, I did. So we had a, a, a conversation. He mentioned an obscure Stiff Betis reference, I get it. He talked about our child, I get it. We put back, we have, a, we have a language. And he would just give me everything and wouldn't ask for everything. And when he would talk about a concert he saw or a wrestling match at the Olympic, going to John at the Olympic, and he wasn't just recalling things, he was sharing his memories with you. And that's a very, very special thing. He, he wasn't hoarding his memories. He wasn't hoarding his moments. He wanted you to live these memories with him. You could see it through the thick glasses in his eyes. He was a 16-year-old kid again. He's watching Arthur Lee in Love. He's watching um, you know, Gordon and Black Goliath wrestling. He's watching you know, some obscure film. And he's a kid again, and he wanted you to be a kid with him. And that was a really special thing. I mean, because he, he wasn't holding back. And I thought tonight, and you know, I would wear a Hawaiian shirt and the monster because it happened to pretend to be Eric, but that's pretending. Eric didn't pretend. What you saw is what you got, and what you got is a, a really loving, special guy. And I spoke to Eric Friday, and um, we talked about something, about the things like that, and um, I saw him, I think, a week earlier, and he said, oh, I forgot your birthday. Well, my birthday's in March, but that's okay. He still thought I had a birthday. And he, he brought me a book by um, the Destroyer, Doc Director's Wrestler. And he said, I wanted to sign it for you, Dan. And Eric had the book signed for me, and he forgot he had it signed, so he had to sign it again. So, I, so that's Eric, that's Eric thinking of other people. You know, he had, he had this book now on my bookcase, two signatures, and when he called me Friday, we talked wrestling and whatnot, and he was just a kid. He was always innocent, and this town that doesn't last a long, and he never became jaded or cynical, and I guess we can call him an explorer of exploitation and rock and roll record but these things were true to Eric. And someone had said, um, well, I was working for a Blitz, Sweat, and Tears one time, and I said, you know, you've always done stuff for me. I wanted to meet you to meet the band. We were doing a show in Vegas. So he was happy, he had some stuff. No, it wasn't the original band. It was like, the band had got the permutations, but I went out, I brought Eric, and I said, Eric, come on, the band's coming here. He's, he's walking around, I said, Eric, come on, here's the band right here. So I went out to make sure everything's okay. I looked back in the room, and I can't find Eric. I'm looking at this Blitz, Sweat, and Tears, I can't find Eric. I said, well, here we go. 
he's in the wrong room with the wrong band. And I'm like, fuck Eric, that's not the wrong, I said, you know what, he was having a good time. So why say anything, you know, I mean, it didn't matter, he was having a good time. Like, they're signing the stuff for me, you know, I'm like, you know, I did it, I and I said, who am I to say no? And it was, it was just, he was just a fun guy to be with, and I would go out, we, he would call me, we'd have obscure talks, we'd go to the pantry, we'd buy tea, you always knew Eric had because you'd look at his shirt and his beard, oh, that was this, that was this, but that was who he was, and I wouldn't have changed it for a minute, and it was just, you know, I, I met Eric, when I, before I even knew Eric, I saw the poet in the back of the magazines, Hollywood Book and Post, I'm like, what is this place, right, what is this magical place, and you meet it and you go, this is the guy behind the curtain. This is who it is and stuff, and I was just and guys like guys like Eddie Brandt who's passed away, guys like Forey, guys like Mike Franey, guys like Eric. These were the guys. These were the vanguards. These were the guys that brought the films, they brought the music, they brought it to life to us. And we have to remember that. I mean, I would go to wrestling shows, obscure wrestling shows. Eric would be in the car. I would go to conventions. Eric's over there. I'd go to shows. The Rock show. Eric's there. So when Eric was there, that's a sign of approval. Eric, okay, Eric says it's good, cool. that's someone I can talk to. And I had a conversation with Eric, I said, she's Eric, I hate Comic Con, I hate it, it's awful, I hate the people, I hate fucking crowds, I hate it, I hate everything about it, I'll, I'll never go. He says, you have a book signing for me at Comic Con? I go, yeah, show on that. <laughs> that was Eric, so, I, and I never worked this his booth, but I was, I was at the table signing the, the book, and the wall's over here, and I'm signing and signing, and also, he decides to leave to get my teeth. Like five hours later, who the fuck were you? I mean, I mean, the table had, there were so many people, the table had gone against the wall. I was being crushed, and he couldn't get to the table. Um, but I would have not done it for anyone else but him. And my second book signing was at the store, and that book was a labor of love because he loved it. He couldn't wait to give me stuff, tell me stories, and share things. And that was just, he was a great guy. And um, we spoke Friday, and I said, well, I'll see you next week, and we'll talk, and you know, and I'm always thinking Eric's gonna be there. And a lot of people have said, in to some case, well, that part of Hollywood's gone, and that part of Hollywood's gone for me, but I come here Sunday afternoons with my nine-year-old son, and we watch Kitty Matinees, yeah. and my son knew Eric, and he's hanging with the crowd here and stuff, and he's always smiling, and Eric gave my son a lobby card at the time machine, which is on my son's wall all the time, and Eric, my son draws it, he knew Eric, so, you know, Eric may be gone, but his influence will live on my son, will live with all of us, and, Eric didn't have a strong heart, he had a big heart. And that's all the difference in the world. I just wanted to bring that I just told one quick story too about Eric and his childlike joy for things. And I grew up in New York, and like a lot of people grew up in New York, I can be kind of uptight and, you know, not as chill as Eric is. You know, Eric was always chill, the worst things. I, one time at a convention, I crashed his van into somebody else's car, and, and Eric, of course, didn't put on the he put on the one credit card that didn't offer free insurance. But the most he would, the most he would say, oh, all right, well, you know, he couldn't get that flustered by it. And um, one time I was with Eric down in Florida. We were doing a Disney Anna convention at the Contemporary Hotel in Walt Disney World. And for those people who criticize horror movie fans for being eccentric or unusual or strange. Uh, Hardcore Disney fans are probably the strangest of them all. And we're doing this convention, and I had stayed there as a kid, you know, back in the 70s, and I remembered it had a great game room in the downstairs, a really big game room. And I, I brought Eric down there, and they had a whole wall, a bank of old school skee ball machines, the type that spit out tickets. You know, when you get some good score, you get five tickets, 10 tickets, 20 tickets. And of course, I introduced Eric to the skee ball machine, and so for the rest of the convention, he would just disappear. I'd be at the table, and he'd say, hey, you want some drink? I'll uh, get some soda. I'd say, all right, um, give, me, uh, give me an orange soda. Said, all right, I'm gonna go to the snack bar down, downstairs. And an hour later, I'd be, where the hell is Eric? You know, I'm dying here, there's nobody to help me, and I'm thirsty, where's that soda? I'd, say, I'd get someone next to me to watch the table, and I'd go down to the snack bar, look for Eric, no. And of course, I'd find him at the ski ball machines, and he would be there all weekend with pockets full of tickets coming in. And I would just get annoyed that, where is he? Disappeared again. And I'll make a check, find Eric at the ski ball machines. But then at the end of this weekend, Eric had you know, some insane number of tickets, something like you know, 8,323 tickets. And you know, we're looking, what can we get? What can we get? And we, we ended up at that little shop where you can get the little toys and prizes when you're you know, eight years old or something. 
And there I am with Eric, feeling like a kid again, as, oh, for 200 we can get the, the little miniature billiards table. And wow, uh, spider rings, we can get 100 spider rings. And, and plastic army men with parachutes, wow, we can get 50 of those. And, and then we get, get all this stuff, just junk, that you know, he probably spent hundreds of dollars getting these tickets to get this junk. And then we go back to the room and our balcony, and we're sitting there for like the next couple of hours just taking these plastic parachute army men and throwing them off and most of them are just collapsing to the ground and crawling and trying to stand up and trying to play billiards on this like little like six inch billiard table. <laughs> and you know, that was the first time I, you know, since I was a kid that I actually, you know, did something like that again. And it was just that absolute joy. Eric made you a kid again. He made you enjoy and appreciate those things you kind of forgot as you got older and jaded and cynical and mean sometimes and just used to a, a hard, cruel world that wanted something from you. And you be around Eric and you realize, you know, this is the world I was in as a kid where everything was amazing, everything was you know, new and wonderful and fun and goofy and ridiculous and you didn't have to stress about the little things. You know, I was the kind of person, if I dented my car, I'd spend a month going, fuck, I shouldn't have parked there, what the fuck did I park there? I should have parked over there. And, and from Eric, I learned just to be like, all right, whatever. We do have, I see uh, Janet Coleman, is Janet here? And I know some of you just arrived for the Tintorera, uh, Mary Mary Bloody, uh, Mary double feature, we will get to that. Um, we're just finishing up some stuff here with a good friend Eric. Those of you who have known Eric over the years, I hope I'm glad you guys could make it at this point. I'm Janet Coleman and I go back with Eric to my two cousins and my niece who went to University High School in West LA. I met Eric through them. Also, there's another connection uh, I'm a poster dealer as well, and my late husband, Bob, who had a shop on La Cienega, left me with the shop and no knowledge on how to run it. <laughs> I have been a teacher for 32 years. So starting 14 years ago, I contacted Eric. And after all, he and my husband, Bob, had been buddies for years and years and years. And due to Eric, I got the confidence and the inspiration, and I gave him the admiration to help me run the store. Well, I would often need a poster for a customer that I didn't have. I would call up Eric, and as Sid Haig said, he would say, what's up? Uh, can you help me, Eric? I need such and such a poster. He says, be here in 20 minutes. I'll have it wrapped up for you. Okay. So I'd fly off from West Hollywood to Hollywood Boulevard, pick up the poster, and be back to the shop in time to meet the customer. Speaking of the um, Lions, Arthur Lyons Film Noir Film Festival, in Palm Springs every year, and we would always go, and so would Eric. He would sit in the third row in the same seat because of his vision. So um, a, a picture would end, and he'd run up to us to ask what we thought about it. He would give us the complete critique, and then he said, I would talk longer, but in order to get to the casino and back for the next performance, I better leave right now. And there were four movies a day. So you can imagine what Eric's schedule was like. I'll remember him forever. He was just, what can I say? Everybody said the same thing. And Eric, all I can say is thank you, and I know that you and Bob are up there selling posters to everybody. Thank you. I know they have probably given away a lot of posters also. And speaking of the um, film noir festival, is Alan still here? Alan Rohde? Yeah. Alan left already, because let's see what we got here. Alexia? Alexia? And Eric always thought of other people when he was out places. I mean, I can't tell you how many stacks I have of autographed porn star photos when he goes to the various <laughs> conventions, all signed to Brian. Hundreds of people I've never heard of, but he'd always come back with a stack of things signed for me just because he'd always think of you while he was getting something for himself. I, I'm glad you mentioned that because I have lots of pictures too. Um, 
I mean, I think the first thing I want to say is that um, I'm here because of Eric. I mean, we all are in this room, but I'm in this town because of Eric. He was my family at, in LA, and um, but not just in LA. You know, a lot of us, we come here for, because we have similar interests, and you know, our real family doesn't quite get that, oh yeah, this film thing is like something we love, and we live for it every day. We have a big passion for it for a reason. And um, so I was, because of Eric, I was able to live in Hollywood, transition to, to be in, in, in Los Angeles. Um, gosh, it's so hard. Um, so whenever he had a show, I'd help him out at the convention and, and got to go to Disney World because of him. And he's like, oh yeah, we're gonna go to Vegas. Or, okay, I'll, I'll go to Vegas. We're gonna go to Palm Springs. Okay, cool, I guess we're going to Palm Springs. Okay, the, the ring come. Okay, great, all right. <laughs> you know, it was just, yeah, this adventure. And I think that's one of the reasons why we got along so well is because of sense of adventure and, and fandom. And, and um, yeah, I love, love of movies and escapism. And, and he just had this unconditional love. It didn't matter who you were, um, but you loved we love movies, and um, we could vent about, like, my family or whatever. It doesn't matter. It's like, all right, well, come, come on down to Big Wang. We'll watch a Clipper game, and, and then we'll go see, go to the Arclay or the New Beverly, and I'll see a movie I never heard about before, and I'm like, oh, I feel so much better at it, I, you know, because Eric took me, and uh, he scooped me up and, and watched over me. So it was very similar. So, and I know he's watching over all of us. And, and, um, and, and here, so I, um, I wanted to uh, read a poem uh, found uh, at his house. Um, he actually wrote this in 1972, so he, <laughs> it's 20. <laughs> um, let's try to get through it. Um, okay, all right, it's called Give a Damn by R. King. Let man in his infinite wisdom walk the streets of gray and black and blood red. See one fall to the ground and lie still. Who cares anymore? The streams and the blackness of the alley, the hushed voices, the running footsteps just walk on by. Yes, who is ahead now? Time is running out and late for my appointment. The dim figure lying on the street a child's cry for help. Yes, must hurry, hurry, late again. Shots across the street, pretty girl dragged into a car. <laughs> House in flames, green light. You can go a little faster than that, can't you? Uh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, is Dan Westbrook still here? Uh, Dan, Dan Westbrook. Okay, Mary Romanek. Is Mary here? Mary? Uh, Whitney, Whitney, are you still here? Whitney? Thank you, Brian. Thank you for putting this on, Brian. This is great. This is a great trip. Yeah, a lot of people here helped out. A lot of people at the theater and a lot of friends of Eric helped out, too. So a lot Thank of you, guys. Here. I first met Eric in 1974, so a billion years ago. And his partner is Trevor Palmer, who is a friend of mine. And he says, yeah, this guy, you know, he's got uh, movie posters. You might want to meet him. OK. So I meet Eric. And, hey, what's going on? So anyway, he's got a poster on the XD Unknown that I wanted. And it's like, OK, how much? Uh, Ten dollars, but seven fifty. Okay, I'll take it. So I ended up getting Dean Jagger to sign it because he used to come to this bookstore he used to run. So, which is great. Anyway, still have that poster. So, what happens is years later we start seeing each other, and I'm working at the Bruin Theater, and Eric would set up a card table in front of Sammy's camera over in Westwood, and he'd be selling his movie posters and stills and everything. It's like, hey, what's going on? So I'd see him, we talk, and it's like, look, I'm, we're running King Kong. Do you want to see the 10 o'clock show? Yeah, sure, I'll, I'll be there. So anyway, 12.30, I'm closing up, and it's like, uh, can I still see the show? And it's like, dude, you got about 10 minutes left. <laughs> so anyway, we became really fast friends, and he goes, you want to come over to the house? And I said, yeah, sure, we'll, what do you, we'll hang out and stuff. And he goes, 
Well, my dad, you know, Stan, who was a great guy, and we're going to run the Seahawk. I said, wow, Errol Flynn, let's do it. So we periodly, in a lot of period times, I would come over and, and he'd run all these great black and white movies. And so I see this like really good looking dark haired gal there. I said, wow, who's that? Oh, uh, it's my sister. It's like, really? Well, she's pretty cute. I'm like, ask her out for a date. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway. But we, she and I became really good friends, and sadly, she's no longer with us, but she was a great, great gal, wonderful, wonderful gal. And Stan was a, a wonderful guy to talk with, very knowledgeable, very smart man. But I didn't get to work for Wade, Eric, I did watch his table a couple of times, but, uh, <laughs> as we all did. But uh, he had a guy who worked for him by the name of Jason Ross. Anybody remember Jason? There you go. This guy was born in France. And he learned how to speak English by watching the Bowery Boys and Neil Gorsuch. So, so he had this really weird, bizarre accent. So, he was like, "Hey, I, you, uh, you know, you guys, listen, don't, don't be a wise behind my boy." Really weird. So we're doing a, a convention. I ended up doing a lot of shows with Eric, and we traveled the circuit, Casual Con. And, Doug Wright shows, what have you. So we're doing one over at the, the Jack Tar, and uh, there were five of us in a room <laughs> to save money in San Francisco. And uh, it was myself, Joe Viscoso, uh, Jason, um, let's see who else was there, uh, Jeff Siliphant, if anybody remembers Jeff Siliphant. Anyway, we were in there. Two days before, uh, Jason and, and Eric had gone to Disneyland, and I didn't know this. So this is 1980, if I remember right. And uh, we're talking about movies, we're having a great time, we're, we're just talking about films. And Jason produces these 35 millimeter film strips. And, well, and they're really professionally done. And they're like, wow, what's that? Oh, uh, they're the new uh, you know, slides from uh, Empire Strikes Back. It's not out yet. So it's like, I go over and look at it and go, hey, these are from Tomorrowland. <laughs> and Eric goes, ha 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 ha. But, but the best story was, there was a guy who used to put on shows by the name of Doug Wright, and he was not a nice guy. You couldn't do another show and do his at the same time. And Eric, as industrious as he was, he would do two shows, three shows at a time. And he'd travel back and forth, over there, over here. Anyway, Doug Wright would blacklist you, which is restraint of trade, according to uh, the law. But uh, anyway, he and Jason dress up in their disguises, and, and Jason was dressed up like a Scotsman with a really bad red beard. <laughs> and he was Angus McRoss. <laughs> with this really weird French Leo Gorski accent. And Eric was dressed up like the mummy. <laughs> and so he had these bandages around his head. And, he, <laughs> and that's all he would say. So needless to say, they got kicked out of the show. <laughs> But we, we had great times. We had wonderful times together, and he had a heart of gold. And, uh, you know, we all miss him. And uh, he's probably just looking down on us and saying, all these people love me, and I love them. So, thank you. Is uh, Joey Gaynor still here? Joey? Nope. Bill Margold? Nope. Bill's here. Bill's coming in. Process elimination. A um, couple of things. I've been listening to all of this. I've been watching all of this. It's very nice that it's on videotape. Shame you never had a videotape at the store itself because that place was an insane asylum. Uh, I really loved going in there. I met Eric around probably the late 70s, and I was introduced to him by a man whose name was mentioned here, Jim West, which was Titus Moon. And I sort of helped bring Eric into the x ray industry, because that's where I've been my whole life. And Eric loved it. He got to be kicked out of it. He was very generous to it, because people would come there and put on book shows and signings. Serena, Christy Canyon were among the people, and he, he reveled in it. I, as I always said, he went from cult to core. And in a sense, 
listening to all of this, it made me realize what Eric, the de true definition of Eric, that he was the ultimate fan. He lived the life of a fan, and we are all fans. We're fans of life, we're also fans of people who managed to become famous. We're also fans because we're not ashamed to admit that we're fans. I keep hearing about all of this up there, and I think that's a lot of crap, because I think up there is a bore. I think the bottom line is that Eric's the happiest hell in hell looking at the lights. Yeah. And with that, I'll end my conversation. I, look, I wish him well, because he was so, the, I, I've never met a person in my life that I couldn't criticize, and I could not criticize Eric Hayden. So down in hell where he's having fun, enjoy it. <laughs> Uh, did Courtney join her making yet? If not, he definitely read from. Nope. Courtney? You know, Courtney was not going to be able to make it on time, so I just want to read something. This is from uh, Courtney Joyner, another friend of Eric's. I want to say it was either uh, German Robles, Terence Fisher, or Captain Lou Albano that brought me together with Eric. It was 30 years ago, and I'd just come to LA and couldn't believe all the cool places along Hollywood Boulevard, but the coolest was Eric's shop because he was cool. He was relaxed and funny didn't have that silly collector's elitism, which was kind of a shock to experience for me. Eric wanted to talk movies, and if you loved what he loved, which was everything, the conversations could go on for days. Ours went on for 30 years. Starting with Mexican horror, which we're celebrating tonight, for those who want to stay after this, and going on from there. It was Eric who first asked me to moderate a Q&A at the New Beverly, and Sherman was all for it. When Eric needed a 16 millimeter print, I was on the speed dial. And when he got a rare lobby card, which he absolutely did, I was on his. I convinced Lawrence Tierney to do his turns at Eric's tables for conventions, and Eric made sure to hunt rare Alistair McLean scripts for me and then hand them off under the table. If some guys were getting together to watch some flicks, he kept me on the invite list. Even when I wasn't able to go, Eric always extended the invitations. There were dinners and movie paper swaps and just that great continuity in our lives through ups and downs. No matter what, we always knew we would see each other at one time or another. Not being able to give Eric a call or walking into a convention and not seeing him sit there and even watched the table when he grabbed a soda. I'm going to feel lost and disconnected, and for a long time. I will miss my friend. It's from Courtney Joyner. Is there anybody I've missed who wanted to get up here and say something I did not, but I did call? Sorry, Ariel, please. followed from me being a um, film fan um, and two graduate experiences from me just getting a, um, a graduate degree in film theory to becoming a film archivist um, to working for the Film Noir Foundation now. And our, um, our relationship has, it changed um, through that time. I'm also born and raised in Hollywood, which has been a very, very big deal for my knowledge of Hollywood Book and Poster. And from what everyone here has said about Hollywood changing, because I used to go to movies on Hollywood Boulevard as a kid, and I've watched the boulevard change completely. And it's, it's broken my heart. Um, and losing Aaron, for me as an archivist, is repeats what you know what Lisa said earlier and what everybody has said because I feel like losing Eric is losing an archive. Um, but I also feel that from hearing what a lot of people here have said, you guys are all an archive too. Um, it's interactive, but I feel like we could not somehow, because I think it's very important what Brian was saying to I know it's analog, what he was doing, but I think we also have an oral history that we can contribute to. Um, and it has to do with, um, with Eric. And I think we're losing something if we don't do it. Um, because everything I've heard today, um, whether I was there because, or not, because a lot of it took place before I was born, thanks. But um, I want to hear more. 
I want all of this because I, I love what Betty said about him being, you know, the underdog. Because that was so much part of it. There were so many things that I experienced with, with my, you know, I got into wrestling and then I found out that there was, that was something that, um, that Eric and I shared. And then our, when I would see him at the film noir f festivals, I was like, wow. And our relationship changed because we could have those conversations on something other than like the movies we would, I would see him at here at the New Beverly. And it was such a different conversation that I shared with Eric. So it went from going, ooh, Black Christmas, this is so cool, to, oh my God, Rita Hayworth, what a babe. Um, and that was such a different conversation. And that's something I really treasure. Like, I would sit there with him, and that's something that was really special to me, because I loved being at the Grindhouse films here. I really, really did. It's a, it was a big thing for me, because um, I'd never heard of them before I started coming here. I didn't know anything about exploitation, and that was such a, such a big thing. Um, and then having those conversations at the Noir Festival and seeing how when this was all kind of a hidden secret world and Eric opened that world to me and by opening that world to me it really was a key thing in making me who I am and bringing me to where I am and giving me the life I have where I'm doing something I love and um, you know I want to thank Eric for doing that I want to thank you Eric and you know all of us let's take his lessons to heart and you know be a little you know more kind a little nicer a little more giving not you know kind of tallying things up in the columns, well, I gave this much, I, did, I, I expect this much back. Because Eric was never looking for what he was going to get back. Eric gave you something because he wanted to give it to you. And it was never a case of, well, I'm doing something for you because I expect a favor in return. Eric did it for you because he enjoyed doing it for you, he enjoyed sharing his passion and his love with you, and he enjoyed sharing his just childlike wonder at the world and things that were, you know, thrown in front of him. And so, you know, thank you, Eric, for being, you know, such a huge part of my life. And, you know, making my life I have today possible. So thank you, Eric. I want to thank all of you for being Eric's friends because that's really what was most important to me. Eric was finding friends to share his love for these things. Somebody could call up and say, hey, I'm running off to see this show, or to see this band, or to see this film. And you know, all of you guys was such a key part of Eric's life. You know, objects when like, over the poster store, the physical objects themselves didn't really have that much value to him. Eric had an amazing collection of posters, and he didn't really give a damn about them. Were, you know, some of his best posters were frayed, shredded, ripped. And I remember being in the store once, and he's standing eating some crazy sandwich of some sort, and he's dripping stuff, and I see he's standing on clearly a half sheet, and it was ended up being a pretty good half sheet, I recall. And he's just standing on it, dripping stuff on it, and Eric, you're standing on a half sheet. Oh. And of course, he picks it up while he's still standing there and rips it in half. And it didn't matter to him because it was just an object. And at the end of the day, it's just an object that really does not make a difference, you know, up in our time on this, on this world, these collections and objects and things. And I think Eric really understood that. These, these objects and things and collectibles, it was all just a pathway for him to meet all of you guys and to enrich your life and enrich his life. So a big thank you to Eric and thank you all guys for coming down here and, and celebrating what Eric's life and his passion. So thank you guys. We are running very, very late, and some of you just arrived for the double feature. I think we're like an hour and a half late for the start of the double feature. But if anybody would like to stay, we're going to take a little bit of time to sort of let people, you know, greet people and say farewell. But we will um, be going soon. We have a double feature of two Mexican exploitation films. The first film, Tintorera, is a film that's Eric's print was showing. So if anybody would like to stay, we'll be going shortly for this double feature. For those who have, uh, can't stay any longer, thank you guys for coming down. Appreciate it.